بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our last episode we spoke about <coughs> the various reasons why Quraysh opposed the message of the Prophet. And those reasons ranged from everything like arrogance, their, uh, the idea that the Prophet didn't fit the mold of a Prophet in their minds. Their, uh, they felt that, this, that the Prophet's teachings were represented a new way of life and they were more comfortable with uh, religious practices that were old and had endured the test of time. Uh, in this episode, I'd like to shed some light on the opposition tactics of Quraysh. Now, as the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, as he's gaining momentum, as people start to convert to Islam, Quraysh realizes that this religious movement is not going to fizzle out. They start to take the the message and the movement of the Prophet more seriously. And they do a number of things. And, and we're going to be looking at the, the different tactics that Quraysh uses to, to basically put a stop to this new religion. And the order that we're going to cover these uh, tactics is, is not in any chronological order. But these, uh, I'll share seven tactics that they used to, uh, to try to obliterate the, uh, the message of the Prophet. Number one, <clears throat> when you look at the, the early Meccan period, you see that Quraysh, first and foremost, when they, when they realize that Muhammad and his message is a threat to the status quo, the polytheists of Mecca, the Quraysh, the first thing, among the first things that they do is that they appeal to the highest authority in Mecca. They appeal to the chief of Quraysh, who is, at this time, Abu Talib. Uh, he was succeeded, of course, by his own father, Abdul Muttalib. So you have all of these clans, the chiefs from these clans, they come together, and, of course, Muhammad is not a random person he's not a you know a loner he belongs to the tribe of Quraysh and specifically he belongs to the clan of Bani Hashim so when the prophet started preaching and he starts to gain momentum and people are joining his movement Quraysh they go to Abu Talib and very respectfully because they had respect for the various chiefs, they gently say to Abu Talib, O oh Abu Talib, this is your nephew. Your nephew Muhammad is cursing our idols. He's preaching a new message that's creating a lot of disturbance in our society. And of course, you as the, the chief, you, you have to keep the peace. Surely you cannot allow this to continue. You know, he's disrupting uh, our culture, he's disrupting our families, he's speaking ill of our ancestors. Now, of course, at this stage, Abu Talib did not want any confrontation. He, he also spoke to them, he listened to their grievances, and he said that he will take their grievances uh, to the Prophet. So he gave them some gentle words and let them go their way. But of course, uh, the problem was not resolved in their minds. You know, as new people converted to Islam, and I want you to keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that when a person joins Islam, it creates a lot of tension in the family. So imagine you have a son who becomes a Muslim. He's now, he's, he's now joined the Prophet. And you have presumably polytheistic siblings, parents, so it creates a, uh, a rift in many families. So you can imagine that as new people converted to Islam, 
there was more there were more rifts in families there was more uh, chaos in uh, in Meccan society so as people converted to Islam Quraysh increased their pressure on Abu Talib and they accused the Prophet of cursing their idols and insulting their forefathers now of course this is not true the Prophet never you know, cursed their idols, nor did he insult uh, their forefathers. In their minds, the Prophet was preaching the oneness of God, which implies that these idols are not real deities. And therefore, that means that our forefathers are, Muhammad is insinuating that our forefathers were misguided, and therefore, we take that as an insult. So, the Prophet ﷺ does not ever use disparaging uh, language when he engages with the mushrikeen. You know, he, as the Quran says, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ The Prophet exhibited and displayed the highest moral character. In fact, the Quran in Surah Al-An'am verse 108, Allah explicitly instructs the Prophet to not insult the idols. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَسُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ Allah says, addressing the Prophet and addressing all of the believers, and do not insult those they invoke other than God. Don't speak ill of their idols lest they insult God in enmity without knowledge. Because if you insult what they deem to be sacred, they will, res- they will retaliate by speaking blasphemous things about God. They will insult God in the same way that you insult their idols. So it was the Prophet's policy, it was the, it was the Qur'anic injunction for the early Muslims not to insult and not to use disparaging language against the mushrikeen and not even against their objects of worship. So Quraysh, they, they became so desperate, you know, even in those early years when they were negotiating with Abu Talib that they went so far as to bribe the Prophet, meaning that they, they go to Abu Talib and they say to him that, you know, we've come to you again and again, and now we want to make an offer. It seems that our words are falling on deaf ears. Maybe we need to sweeten the deal. So we want to offer your nephew money, whatever money he wants. Let us know what his price is, and, he, and we will give it to him. We will make him the wealthiest man in Arabia, provided that he suspends and he discontinues his preaching. If he desires women, you know, if he wants women, we will find him the most beautiful women in Arabia, and we will gift them to him. He'll have the most beautiful women if that's what he desires. And if, if that's not sufficient, if what he desires is power and authority over us, we're willing to make him the king of Arabia. We're willing to give him authority. And this is, of course, unprecedented, considering that the Arabs among themselves, they didn't really have, you know, a king because, you know, they were too arrogant to recognize one single person as the head of all of the tribes. So they present these... uh, they present uh, these offers to Abu Talib and they ask him that present our request to your nephew. So Abu Talib, salamullahi alayhi, he summons his nephew, he summons the Prophet. And he conveys, you know, the, the list of grievances that were put forward by Quraysh and as well as the bribes that were being offered in terms of uh, money, women, and power. And of course, the the famous response of the Prophet, which is recorded 
uh, in, in even the oldest uh, historical accounts, the Prophet he says, Ya Am, O oh my dear uncle, Wallahi law wada'u shamsa fi yameeni wal qamara fi yasari ala an atruka ala ala an atruka hadha al amr hatta yudhhiruhu Allah aw uhlika fihi ma taraktu O oh my uncle I swear by God if they were to place the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand I cannot give up this message until I succeed in what I am doing or I die in this path preaching what I am preaching. So you see the Prophet you see his, his resilience, his great resolve. And of course, the Prophet along with Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa and Isa السلام, he is in the company of the Prophets of Ulul Azm, the Prophets of great resolve. Now when Abu Talib hears this, when he hears the determination of his nephew, he says, اذهب يا ابن أخي Go forth, O my nephew. فقل ما أحببت And speak what you wish. فوالله لا أسلمك لشيء أبدا I swear by God, I will never surrender you to anyone ever. And of course, when the other chiefs of Quraysh, when the other uh, uh, leaders of the various clans, when they were meeting with Abu Talib, the, what, what was being insinuated and implied by the pressure that they were putting on him is that they were essentially asking him to hand him over. Meaning that they, they respected that he was protected by his tribe. But they were trying to put enough pressure on Abu Talib where he would just, you know, surrender Muhammad to them. Uh, because we have to keep in mind that a chief, any king is only as strong as the support that he receives. You know, even, even the kings and the presidents around the world today, even if they are, you know, tyrants, they, they still have to appease certain people to support their power structures. So they were trying to hint to Abu Talib that if you want to remain strong and powerful, you have to appease us. You have to meet us halfway. And what they had wished was for Abu Talib to surrender uh, their, his nephew to them. And this is, of course, what brings us to the second tactic. So their, their first tactic was to appeal to Abu Talib, who is the highest authority in among the Quraysh. He's the most respected of the of the leaders of the clans. And they try to, you know, uh, diplomatically suggest to him that he should silence his nephew. Now, of course, that doesn't work. The various bribes they offered. Uh, did not, uh, you know, were not accepted. And then you see that the second tactic of Quraysh in their opposition to the Prophet and his message is that they, they make a very treacherous offer. Uh, the historical uh, accounts mention that, uh, and you can find this uh, in uh, the seerah of Ibn Hisham and others, they come to Abu Talib. And then, and you can see how they keep on upping the ante, as they say. Ya Abu Talib. So the, they see that Abu Talib is unwilling to surrender his nephew. He doesn't want to lose his nephew. So Quraysh, they come to him and they say, Ya Abu Talib, Hada Umar ibn al Walid, Abha fatan fi Quraysh wa ajmaluhu. O Abu Talib. This is Umar ibn al-Walid. He is the most noble and the most handsome youth of Quraysh. فَخُذْهُ إِلَيْهِ Take him. He's yours. You can raise him as your own son. فَاتَّخِذْهُ وَلَدًا فَهُوَ لَكَ Raise him as your own son. He belongs to you. Consider him your family. 
And we do this, we just want one thing from you. وَسَلِّمْ لَنَا هَذَا ابْنَ أَخِيكَ We want to do a trade. We will trade Umar ibn al-Walid, this dashing young man, this wealthy, this handsome young man, this noble young man. We will give him to you. You can take him as a son and we want you to surrender your nephew to us. Your nephew who has what? الَّذِي قَدْ خَالَفَ دِينَكْ وَدِينَ آبَائِكْ This nephew of yours who has opposed your religion. So you see, Quraysh believes that Abu Talib is a mushrik. They believe that he, he shares the same faith as them. And you can only imagine that if Abu Talib publicizes, publicly declares his Islam, he would not have this powerful negotiating position. So the fact that it's perceived that he's a mushrik, that actually works to, it to his advantage. It puts him in a position to protect the Prophet because in their minds, Abu Talib is not a Muslim, so he's, he's relatively impartial because he, he's a polytheist. He follows our religion and the religion of our forefathers. So they say to Abu Talib that surrender. We give you this young man, Umar ibn al-Walid, and we want you in exchange to surrender your nephew who has opposed your religion and the religion of your forefathers. So you see that even, even Abdul Muttalib, you know, and some, some ulama say that they, they hid their faith, they concealed their faith for various reasons. Uh, so the Quraysh assumed that Abdul Muttalib and Abu Talib were on this, on this path, this tradition of polytheism. Now Abu Talib, he angrily retorted, فَقَالَ أَبُوْ طَالِبْ وَاللَّهِ مَا أَنصَفْتُمُونِي He says, My God, by God, you are unjust to me. You have not been fair with me. تُعْطُونِي إِبْنَكُمْ أَغْذُوهُ لَكُمْ وَأُعْطِيكُمْ إِبْنِي تَقْتُلُونَ You give me your son so I, so I can feed him for you. And I give you my son so you can kill him. هَذَا وَاللَّهِ مَا يَكُونُ أَبَدًا By God, this will never happen. So Abu Talib, he declines, of course. And then the narration says, فَقَالَ لَهُ الْمُطْعِمْ إِبْنِ عَدِي إِبْنِ نَوْفَلْ وَكَانَ صَدِيقًا مُصَافِيًا Then a man by the name of Mu'tim ibn, ibn Adi, he was a friend, a close friend of Abu Talib. He says, يَا أَبَا طَالِبْ مَا أَرَاكَ تُرِيدُ أَن تَقْبَلَ مِنْ قَوْمِكَ شَيْئًا Oh Abu Talib, it seems that you are unwilling to accept any offer your people are making to you. They asked you to prevent your, your nephew from preaching. You were unwilling. We offered, they offered your nephew money, women, power. He still refuses. They offered you to exchange, you know, we'll, we'll, give, you, we'll give you another nephew. We'll give you another child in place of Muhammad. You decline. Now, why is it significant that Al-Mut'im ibn Adi is saying this? Because Al-Mu'tam ibn Adi is the senior most person in all of Mecca. He's one of the, the, the great elders of Mecca. And he was the one who actually prevented the bloodshed in Masjid al-Haram when the various clans were fighting about who was going to install the black stone. And he is the one who suggested that the next person who enters the sacred mosque will be the arbiter. So you see that Mut'im is, he's, he's naturally a type of person that wants peace. He likes, he sees himself as an impartial person. He was very respected. And he's always, you know, he's the least hostile person that has the most sense among them. So 
when 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 someone like Al Mu'tam ibn Adi says that oh, Abu Talib, you're you're being unreasonable, so you can only imagine how the tide is now turning against the Prophet and uh, Abu Talib. So Quraysh, they appeal to the highest authority. They appeal to Abu Talib. They they make an offer to Abu Talib that. If you give us Muhammad, we will, in exchange, we'll give you uh, Umar ibn al-Walid, and you can raise him as a son. We'll compensate you for the loss of Muhammad. We'll take him and we'll kill him. We'll slaughter him, but we'll compensate you, and you can raise this another young boy as your own. Of course, Abu Talib uh, declines. Number three, among the tactics of Quraysh is that, and this is actually mentioned in the Quran, is that they censored the Qur'an in public spaces. They prohibited the Qur'an from being recited in public spaces. If you look at Surah Fussilat, Surah 41, verse 26, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us a glimpse into what it was like during the early Meccan period. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا تَسْمَعُوا لِهَذَا الْقُرْآنِ وَالْغَوْ فِيهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَغْلِبُونَ And those who disbelieve say, the kuffar, they say, do not listen to this Qur'an and speak noisily during the recitation of it that perhaps you will overcome. So you see that Whenever the Qur'an was recited in public, people would clap, they would shout, they would try to ensure that people, passerbyers, don't listen to the Qur'an. And, and this was especially, they intensified their efforts, uh, in, uh, especially during the height season, because you would have uh, people from all around the Islamic Empire, all, all, all around the Arabian Peninsula, descending upon... Uh, Mecca, and of course, many of them would hear the Quran, and then they would convert, and they would go back to their people. Uh, so they wanted to prevent this. Now, of course, the Quran, even though they condemned it, they prohibited it from being recited in public. The arch enemies of the Prophet actually enjoyed listening to the Quran. So we have a tradition from uh, An Zuhri, An Sa'id ibn al Musayyib, Musayyib, who's one of the Tabi'een. He says, Anna Aba Sufyan wa Aba Jahlin wal Akhnas, Ijtama'u Laylan, Yasma'oon al Quran Sirran. Abu Sufi, so this, these, are, these are the early years of the Meccan period. Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahl and Al Akhnas. So of course, Abu Sufyan and Abu Jahl, they are the tip of the spear. They are the arch enemies of the Prophet. Now these three men, who are staunch enemies of the Prophet, they gathered one night outside of the house of the Prophet. Now of course, they didn't coordinate this. They just, they just ended up outside of the Prophet's house, listening to him recite the Qur'an at night. They would secretly stand outside of the Prophet's house, they would hide, and they would listen to the Qur'an. And they would listen until dawn, brothers and sisters. Imagine that. Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahl, and Al-Akhnas, they would sit and they would secretly listen to the Qur'an from the middle of the night until dawn. And when they would return home, they would see each other. And you know, one would ask, what are you doing here? And they confessed to each other that they were there listening to the Qur'an. So they, they made a pact among themselves that we cannot come back tomorrow night. Do not come back and do this because you know, pe this people might catch on and they might become suspicious of what you're doing. And they may take this to be an admission that the Qur'an is divine speech. The second night, all three of these men show up again because they enjoyed listening to the Qur'an so much that they, they, they sat, they gathered outside of the Prophet's house at night, they listened to the Qur'an, and then to their surprise, they see each other again. 
and then they, they insist that none of them should come back, and then they all return on the third night. And this is where, after that third night, the narration says, They spend three nights listening attentively to the Qur'an, to the Prophet recite the Qur'an at night. So Al-Akhnas, he says to Abu Sufyan, Ma taqul? What do you say about this Qur'an that the Prophet is reciting? What do you think? What's going through your mind? Abu Sufyan, what does he say? Qala a'rifu wa unkir. He says, I know it's the truth. I know that this is not human speech, but I refuse to acknowledge it. See, this is the, this is the real, one of the, the prime meanings of kufr, kufrul juhud. Qala Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan then asks, Al-Akhnas, Fama taqulu ant? What do you think? He says, Arahu al Al-Akhnas, he says that I, I believe, I see it to be the truth. Now, of course, uh, Abu Jahl, he, his rejection is uh, based primarily on envy and jealousy. That, you know, the, the Bani Hashim, you know, they're already the custodians of Kaaba. They're the ones who distribute water. They are, you know, the, uh, the leaders of the, uh, the, the governing council. And for Nubuwa to also be uh, associated with the clan of Bani Hashim, this was too much for him to accept. So Abu Jahl was definitely, his rejection was uh, largely based on his envy and his jealousy of the Hashemites. Now number four, the fourth tactic that we see of Quraysh is that they would mock the Prophet, and they would mock the believers. They'd make fun of them. And we saw this when the Prophet ﷺ invited his nearest of kin when he, when he summoned his uncles, his cousins, his relatives, and he invited them to Islam. You know, Abu Lahab was the first to, to make a joke and, and, and laugh, and he disrupted the first banquet, and the second banquet, he also made fun of the Prophet, and he specifically made fun of uh, Abu Talib, saying that, you know, Muhammad is commanding you to obey your son, Ali, because he appointed him as his successor and his vicegerent. Now, among the most hostile people to the Prophet and the early Muslims was Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was notorious for his mockery and his ridicule of the Prophet and the early Muslims. In fact, Abu Jahl, you know, his, his hobby, you could say, was to make fun of the Prophet and to uh, torment and uh, belittle the companions of the Prophet. Now, his, the way that he would mock them would depend on their social status. You know, Abu Jahl was keenly aware that, you know, you have to be careful who you're talking to. You don't want to insult someone who belongs to a powerful tribe because then you're just poking the bear. So if it was a person of status, Abu Talib, uh, I'm sorry, Abu Jahl would make fun of him. He would make fun of the person and say to him, you know, how can you leave the religion of your father? Are you better than your father and your grandfather? So he'd use kind of this, uh, this emotional tactic. He would invoke the, the tradition of their forefathers and say, you know, shame on you. You're abandoning the tradition of your forefathers. Are you saying that you're better, that they were misguided and, and, misguided and you're rightly guided? So this is if it was a person of status. If it was someone of a low status, if it was a lowly person, Abu Jahl would actually get physical. Abu Jahl would physically assault some of the companions who did not belong to noble tribes. Uh, you, we, t we have the example of the example of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is originally from Yemen. He's, he's not from Quraysh. He doesn't have a powerful tribe 
backing him in Mecca. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was, you know, among those early Muslims who was courageous and he used to recite the Quran in public, even though he was warned by other companions that, you know, you don't have a tribe to protect you. He was adamant. He recited the Quran uh, near the Kaaba. Now, of course, the Kaaba is a place of socialization. It's the it's a social hub in Mecca. He recites the Quran in public, and he is beaten to a pulp. And and therefore, you see that those who did not belong to powerful tribes uh, were typically they weren't just verbally abused, but they were also physically abused. And number five, you see that in addition to the, the ridicule and the mockery, there was a targeted attempt to discredit the Prophet, meaning that they engaged in the character assassination of the Prophet Now, the Qur'an mentions some of the slanderous things that they said about the Prophet. Of course, among them was... They used to label him as Al-Majnoon, the insane one, the madman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah 68, ayah number 51, He says, وَإِن يَكَادُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَيُزْلِقُونَكَ بِأَبْصَارِهِمْ لَمَّا سَمِعُوا الذِّكْرِ وَيَقُولُونَ إِنَّهُ لَمَجْنُونَ This is one of the verses in the Qur'an where you see that the disbelievers are referring to the Prophet as an insane person, as a majnoon. And subhanAllah, if you look at Orientalists who write about the Prophet, almost all of them use, they recycle a lot of the same things that were uh, said about the Prophet by the polytheists. You know, for example, some Orientalists, when they uh, when they speak about the Prophet, when they write about his life, they say that you know he was experiencing hallucinations. Uh, he had epilepsy, uh, so his so what he believed was revelation. What were you know psychotic episodes, epilepsy, and so on and so forth. So they accuse him number one of being majnoon. Now of course, you know there's there's no evidence of this and. You know, someone who is insane, you know, there are signs of insanity. You know, if he was so insane, no one would trust their valuables with an insane person. Right? You know, if they're infighting, you know, when they were fighting about Hajr al-Aswad, when, when the Prophet ﷺ walked in at the age of 30, they, they didn't call him Majnoon. You know, he was the most rational and the most level-headed, the most, level-headed, the most sensible the most wise among them. So they used to call him Majnoon. Number two, they used to call him a Sahir. They would call him a, mag- a magician, a sorcerer. And this is a an accusation that was directed towards all prophets, especially uh, when they performed supernatural acts. Allah in Surah 51 Verse 52, he says, كَذَٰلِكَ مَا أَتَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ مِنْ رَسُولِ إِلَّا قَالُوا سَاحِرٌ أَوْ مَجْنُونٌ Thus there did not come to those before them a messenger, but they said a magician or a madman. Meaning that every prophet, every rasul that was ever sent to any community was either accused of being a sahir, a sorcerer, a magician, or a majnoon. And in some cases, they were called both, like in the case of the Prophet ﷺ. And we see, for example, in the story of Musa, of course, Musa was, he was accused of being a sorcerer. And this is why Fir'aun, he summons the best sorcerers all across uh, the Egyptian empire to face him off in a match. So, This is uh, an accusation that was uh, uh, put uh, against, uh, you know, almost all of the prophets of the past. And then they called him a a poet, which is interesting because 
history has not recorded the Prophet composing a single couplet. Of course, maybe the Prophet uttered one couplet in his entire history, but the Prophet was not known to be someone who would compose poetry. Uh, in Surah Al-Anbiya, verse number 5, they say, the mushrikeen would say, بَلْ قَالُوا أَضْغَاثُ أَحْلَامُ they have said it, meaning the Qur'an, is only the result of confused dreams. This Qur'an is just jumbled up dreams and visions that Muhammad has every night and then he shares it with us. بَلْ افْتَرَى And it's something that he's fabricated. بَلْ هُوَ شَاعِرٌ They say he's, he's a poet. And even this, even the fact that they call him a poet, is an acknowledgement of the linguistic beauty of the Qur'an. Its, its rhythmic style uh, is potentially one of the reasons why they call him a poet. But the Qur'an is very adamant. Allah in the Qur'an is very clear about the fact that the Prophet is not a poet. It's not befitting for him to be a poet because, you know, you know poets... Their, their mission is not to convey to people, typically at least, it's not to convey truth. You know, poetry is really more about evoking emotion. It's not, it's not a type of literature that gives you the most accurate representation of reality. It's not meant to be literature that is intended to guide people towards a virtuous and a morally upright life. Allah says, وَمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ الشِّعْرَ وَمَا يَنْبَغِيلَ Especially because a lot of the poetry at that time, you know, it was about trivial things. And the Prophet, Allah did not want His Prophet to be associated with that, with those types of people. وَمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ الشِّعْرَ وَمَا يَنْبَغِيلَ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرُ وَقُرْآنٌ مُبِينٌ And we have not taught him poetry, nor is it befitting for him. It is nothing but a reminder and a clear Qur'an. So even if you look at the Prophet's childhood, his adolescence, his youth, he, he never, he never uh, surrounded himself with, with poets. He had never attended such gatherings. He never composed any poetry. What's interesting here is that they called the Prophet a poet and they called Qur'an poetry. And the best poet in Arabia was Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. So if anyone knows poetry, it's Al-Walid. Now once, and of course Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, as we mentioned in our previous session, you know, he was, one, he was the most wealthy, at least one of the most wealthy and prominent people in Mecca. Now once the Prophet was reciting the Qur'an and Al-Walid, he happened to listen to the Qur'an without any interruptions. You know, typically people are making noise, they're clapping, they're creating a lot of ruckus. But Al-Walid, the, as the Prophet is reciting in the Qur'an, he has an opportunity for a few moments to listen and give his undivided attention to the Qur'an. So as he listens to the Qur'an, he's mesmerized. Meaning that he, it, the Qur'an literally stops him in his tracks. He's walking, and the Qur'an is like a magnet that just pulls him. And he doesn't move until the Prophet finishes, and then he goes on his way. Now because Mecca was a very small village, it was a very tight-knit uh, town, he was, and it was a very social uh, place. After Al Walid heard the ayat of the Quran, he muttered something as he was walking away, and people overheard him, and it spread to the people of Mecca. You, you have to understand, seeing Al Walid in public is like seeing a celebrity. They watch everything that you do. They try to even read your lips. So the people of Mecca, of course, there were few people living in Mecca, and you know, it's a very small village, so you know, everything spreads like wildfire. And you know, 
when people heard what he murmured, it spread like wildfire. It became juicy gossip. So as he walks away, he composes uh, beautiful lines about the beauty of the Qur'an as a pagan. So this is the testimonial of a pagan. This is the testimonial of the greatest poet among the Arabs. He says, Wallahi laqad sami'tu min Muhammadin anifan kalaman ma huwa min kalam al-insi wa la min kalam al-jinn. Al-Walid, he says, by God, I have heard a speech, I have heard words from Muhammad right now that is neither from the speech of human beings nor is it from the speech of jinn. Inna lahu lahalawa. There is a sweetness to those words that he recited. Wa inna alayhi latalawa. There's a beautiful rhythm to it. Wa inna a'lahu lamuthmir. Its heights are abundant and fertile. Wa inna asfalahu lamughdiq. Wa innahu ya'lu wa ma yu'la alayhi. It is something that is beautiful and it surpasses everything I've heard and nothing, and nothing can surpass it. This is the admission of Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Now, of course, the news reaches Abu Jahl that Al-Walid has praised the beauty of the Qur'an. You know, this is going to create shockwaves in Mecca. This is going to influence people. It's going to motivate people to go listen to the Qur'an themselves. Now, keep in mind that Abu Jahl and Abu Sufyan, they tried, they, they, put, they exerted great effort to ensure that the Qur'an does not reach the public domains. They wanted to censor it. So when the news reached Abu Jahl, he went to Al-Walid and he said to him that, the people, they've heard your praise of the Qur'an and they will not be satisfied with you until you say something against it. The other chiefs, they're unhappy with you. You can't just praise the Qur'an. You have to say something against the Qur'an. So Al-Walid says, what, he says to Abu Jahl, what do you want me to say? So Abu Jahl says, call Muhammad Majnoon. Call him a madman, an insane person. Al-Walid, he says to Abu Jahl that you and I both know that he's not Majnoon, he's not insane. And everybody knows that Muhammad is a rational person. No one's going to believe. You know, if we're going to lie, at least make it a believable lie. We've all seen crazy people. We know what an insane person is like. We know how an insane person behaves. The way that Muhammad carries himself is the furthest away from insanity. And then Abu Jahl says, let's call him, say that he's a fortune teller. He's a kahin, he's someone who's possessed by a jinn. Again, Al-Walid says that he doesn't fit the description of a fortune teller or someone who's possessed or a kahin. Abu Jahl says, call him a magician. Say that he's a sahir. But again, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, he says that, he, but he isn't a magician. You know, we've seen magicians. We know what magicians are like. He's not one of them. Abu Jahl then said to him, O Walid, then at least say that he's just a poet. And this is where Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, he says, by God, I am the best poet among you. You want to teach me about poetry? I am the best poet among you and I am telling you that this is not the type of poetry that we are used to. You want to teach me about shi'r? I'm telling you this is not poetry. So Abu Jahl said to him that you need to say something and we're not going to be satisfied until you say something. So Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, he says, leave me for a few days. Let me think about what to do. So he goes home and he begins pacing back and forth in his home. You know when, when you're trying to analyze something, when, when there's a problem 
that you're trying to solve, it consumes you. So he's pacing back and forth in his home, trying to come up with an idea. But before he even leaves his house, Allah reveals ayat of the Qur'an telling us exactly what is happening with Al-Walid in the privacy of his home and what he's feeling and what's going through his mind. And this is where you see uh, Surah 109, verses 1 to 6. And I'll skip to the, the part that's about uh, uh, Al-Walid that, that pertains to our discussion. كَلَّا إِنَّهُ كَانَ لِآيَاتِنَا anida. That indeed he is, uh, he was obstinate when it comes to our verses. سَأُرْهِقُهُ sa'uda. إِنَّهُ فَكَّرَ وَقَدَّرْ Indeed, he thought and deliberated. Allah is describing the turmoil that Walid is feeling in his own, in the privacy of his home, about what to say about the Qur'an. ثُمَّ قُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرْ Allah says, indeed, he thought and deliberated. So may he be destroyed for how he deliberated. ثُمَّ نَظَرَ ثُمَّ عَبَسَ وَبَسَرَ ثُمَّ قُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرَ ثُمَّ نَظَرَ ثُمَّ عَبَسَ وَبَسَرَ Then may he be destroyed for how he deliberated. Then he considered again. Then he frowned and scowled. ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ وَاسْتَكْبَرَ Then he turned back and was arrogant. فَقَالَ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ يُؤْثَرَ After days. He came out and said, this is nothing but magic. He ends up going with a sahir, saying that Muhammad is a magician. In hadha illa qawlul bashar. He comes out and he says, this is not but the word of a human being. A few days ago he said that this is not the words of a human being or a jinn. This is something that is beyond the realm of mortals. But now, of course, he has to save face. He's being pressured by Abu Jahl and others, by his other peers. So he comes out and he says that, that Muhammad is a magician. Number six, you see that among the tactics that the Quraysh use is that they make endless demands for miracles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Isra, Surah 70, verses 90 to 93, لَن نؤمن لك حتى تفجر لنا من الأرض ينبوعا And they say, we will not believe you until you break open for us from the ground a spring. Now of course Allah, the Prophet did perform miracles. You know, the splitting of the moon, the Quran itself is the greatest miracle. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to get into this petty, you know, whenever, you know, the Quraysh want a miracle, Allah is going to say, you know, here's another miracle. Because Allah knows that these people are not asking because they genuinely want to know the truth. They are they're asking to challenge. So there's no sincerity in their request. They say to the Prophet, make a, a, a spring gush from the ground. أَوْ تَكُونَ لَكَ جَنَّةٌ مِنْ نَخِيلٍ وَعِنَبٍ فَتُفَجِّرَ الْأَنْهَارَ خِلَالَهَا تَفْجِيرًا Or have God provide you with a garden of palm trees and grapes and make rivers gush forth within them in abundance. أَوْ تُسْقِطَ السَّمَاءَ كَمَا زَعَمْتَ عَلَيْنَا كِسَفًا Or make the sky fall on us in fragments, as you claimed. Or bring God, imagine. They say bring God and the angels before us. We want to see God. We want to see the angels. Or, or have a house of gold. Because, of, because in their mind, this is a sign that someone is connected to the divine. أو ترق في السماء ولن نؤمن لرقيك حتى تنزل علينا كتابا نقرأه قل سبحان ربي 
هل كنت إلا بشر الرسول So they say, you know, have, have a house that's decorated with gold or ascend into the sky. And even then, we will not believe in your ascension until you bring down to us a book that we may read. No, we, Jibra'il revealing the Quran to your heart through this invisible process is not sufficient. We want you to climb into the sky and bring down a book from the sky for us to read. And of course, Allah says to the Prophet, Say to them, Exalted is my Lord. Was I ever but a human messenger? This is not up to me. Allah produces miracles when He sees that it is fit. And finally, of course, they try to make a compromise. They come back and when they see that, when they realize that Islam is not going to go away, the Quraysh begin negotiating directly with the Prophet ﷺ, saying that let's reach a compromise. One day we'll all be Muslim, and the next day we'll all worship idols. So we'll alternate. You know, one day we're Muslims, or one month we'll be Muslims, and then the following month we'll be Mushrikeen. So let's, you know, let you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals Surah Al-Kafirun, where Allah at the end of it says, لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ There is no compromise when it comes to Tawheed. There is no compromise when it comes to monotheism. For you is your religion, and for us is our religion. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for lending me your ears, and I look forward to having you join me in our next episode of The Life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Any questions or comments? When the Quran said to advise Prophet Muhammad among women and kingship specifically, was the king like do people think the kingship was a sincere offer? Because it would need a lot of consensus for that to be upheld. It's hard to tell, you know. We don't know if they would have followed through, but generally, you know, one thing about uh the Arabs, especially when they when they take an oath, is of course the Arabs of Jahiliya had many bad qualities, but among their noble qualities is is if they made a vow, they would uh, they would fulfill the vow. So so when it comes to you know they had certain notable qualities like generosity, right? You know the the Arabs were known for their generosity and for their hospitality. You see that even even the Mushrikeen, you know, they would feed. They would participate in feeding the uh, the pilgrims, so they had they had a relatively generous spirit. They took oaths very seriously. So, you know, presumably this is an oath that they're making, and you know how they would have de- how would it, how would they have delivered this? It's difficult to say. But uh, but this shows you how much they feared Islam. You know, they're willing to appoint the Prophet as their figurehead provided that he doesn't change the social order and the power dynamics in Mecca. So they're willing to part with you know uh, this kind of uh, their power as long as the one who's in power allows them to to operate uh, based on the status quo. about uh, Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahl, and Al uh, Afnas uh, listening to the Quran secretly. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the how this hadith reached us? Because it seems like it's a private conversation. So how did this uh, these facts leak into the public domain? So when you look at uh, so it seems that this was uh, when you look at Al Akhnas. Now I have to I I believe Al Akhnas doesn't end up converting but he comes he's he becomes very sympathetic towards uh, the muslim uh, community so it could have been leaked by him uh, because of because of the uh, of how sympathetic he was uh, to the muslim so you see among abu sufyan and abu jahl 
He was the least hostile. And he actually admitted that I believe it's the truth. But for, for whatever reason, he didn't publicly uh, join Islam. And uh, it, it could be that because of how sympathetic he was to the, uh, the Muslims, this, this story uh, may have reached uh, the Muslims themselves. And, and mind you that Abu Sufyan, at least outwardly, becomes Muslim. So, you know, this, is, this, could, be, uh, this could have been shared by Abu Sufyan himself later on, you know, just to kind of bolster uh, his own credibility that, you know, that, you know, he, he, in the early days, he acknowledged the beauty of the Quran, but he was arrogant and stubborn until the conquering of, uh, of, uh, of Mecca. So it's either Abu Sufyan or Al-Akhnas, but most likely Al-Akhnas uh, divulged this incident to Muslims. I think I've answered this question before, but just very briefly, uh, how do you maintain remembrance of God? I think I mean, this is obviously one of the reasons why uh, salah was legislated. You know, the purpose of prayer, especially if we perform it punctually, is that salah is meant to be those moments of the day which are punctuated with the remembrance of God. You know, if you're praying your five daily prayers on time, throughout the day, you are, uh, inshallah, engaged in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It also helps to have a tasbih with you or a tasbih counter where you can set a goal for yourself that, you know, I want to do, you know, 100, 200 tasbihs throughout the day. That's the healthy way of, of doing it. So in, instead of, you know, checking your social media, you know, how many times do we check our phones during the day. Imagine any time that you're tempted to check your phone, along with it, you do a tasbih. So this, you know, these simple habits uh, can help us increase our uh, dhikr of Allah. And of course, I, I've stated this before, we are going to have days where we feel that we are at a spiritual low. This is natural. This is, this is a very natural process because even... The word qalb comes from the word, verb which means to change. The heart is constantly changing. Your spirituality is always going to fluctuate. But the key is, the goal is that we want our, our spiritual fluctuations to happen at a higher level. So we don't want to be in a situation where when we feel spiritually low, we commit haram and we, we abandon our wajibat. Ideally, your spiritual low should be elevated where on your bad days you do your wajibat and you do some mustahabbat. You know, say for if you're having a spiritually low day, you might not do salatul layl. You might not do salatul ghufayl. You might not read your 50 verses of Quran or two pages of Quran. So when you add all of these small little habits and you do it slowly, you'll be able to build your spirituality gradually without putting too much pressure on yourself. And then when you have your, your spiritually low days, it's not gonna, you're not going to compromise your obligations. You know, so inshallah in the future, a spiritually low day for you would be that I did some of the nawafil today, but I didn't get to do the full 11 rak'ah of salatul lay, so I just did the final Three raka'ah, salatul shafa and salatul watr. And I didn't read two pages of the Qur'an, I read a few verses. So, so that, that's my, my humble recommendation, is that try to uh, set a routine, a program for yourself uh, throughout the day and set you know, uh, small goals for yourself. Whether it's to do tasbih a hundred times uh, throughout the day, and and reward yourself, you know, when you when you reach those, when you accomplish those goals, you know, whether it's, you know, treating yourself to a dessert, whatever you you do, what you need to do to keep yourself uh, motivated. But I think that we have to set attainable, realistic goals for ourselves, and then hopefully we'll see that uh, that incremental progress.
You know, there's even a hadith from, I believe, Imam al-Sadiq where he says, uh, the hadith says, you know, إن أحب الأعمال إلى الله ما داوم عليه العبد وإن قال The most beloved deeds, the most beloved actions in the sight of Allah are those deeds which are done consistently, even if they are small. So for example, let's say someone has a habit. Every night before they go to bed, they do wudu. They consistently do wudu every night before they go to bed. That is more beloved to Allah than praying Salatul Layl, for example, every you know few months. You know, so be develop that consistency. You know, start off with five verses of the Quran every day. Make it, you know, a routine and stick to it. And you'll be surprised how much you can accomplish if you set these little goals for yourself. This is a sacrifice that uh, that Abu Talib made, and and this is a great sacrifice, where you know people doubt your faith, but you do it to protect the faith, and this is what makes uh, Abu Talib uh, unique. You know, so there's there are hadith that mention that he will be rewarded double. He will be rewarded for his faith and he will be rewarded for having the wisdom to conceal his faith. Because the mushrikeen of Quraysh saw Abu Talib as one of their own. And that's why they respected him. And that's why they negotiated with him. If Abu Talib had publicly declared his faith in the Prophet, he would have been ostracized. The Prophet would have lost his most powerful protector. And who knows? And Islam may have not have survived. It's possible that Islam and the early Muslims would have been slaughtered. So, and when we see this very clearly, when the Prophet loses Abu Talib and he loses Khadija, that is when the Meccans plot to assassinate him. So, the presence of Abu Talib was a buffer between the Mushrikeen and the Prophet. So the moment Abu Talib is out of the picture, that's when the Mushrikeen of Quraysh see that the Prophet is vulnerable. And they take advantage. And this is when we see the Prophet's hijrah to, uh, to Medina. So this was the, the wisdom, the hikmah of Abu Talib, that uh, it would have endangered the Prophet and the early Muslims if he announced that he's that he's also a Muslim, it gave him that negotiating position, that negotiating power. <laughs> 